Hi, ladies and gentlemen, it's Mayor Sullivan, and welcome to the 34th episode of Ah Brockton. I can't believe we've done 34 shows. And again, it is Black History Month for the month of February. Um, of course, we should uh, really honor Black History 365 days a year. But um, today we have a special guest, uh, an educator, uh, first African American superintendent for Brockton Public Schools. Uh, really someone that uh, envisions uh, and envelops uh, education and how important education has uh, fostered really learning in Brockton under his leadership when he was superintendent. So it's my honor and privilege to welcome uh, Mr. Bob Jones to the 34th episode of Our Brockton. Mr. Jones, thank you for what you have done and I really appreciate you joining us on the episode today. Thank you. Well, I was a, a born New Yorker, same town as Denzel Washington. I don't have his money or his looks, but I was born in the same town. Uh, so my parents moved f when I was two from Mount Vernon, New, New York to Boston. So we lived in Lower Roxbury, moved on up. Uh, we moved on Pearl Harbor Day, December the 7th, to from Boston to Brockton in an open truck. And I cried the whole way because I was leaving my friends. Anyway, uh, when we moved to Brockton, I discovered a couple of things. One was the Brockton Y, right where it is now, where I learned to swim, and I also got scarlet fever. And I gave it to my brother and my sister. My poor father ha could not come in the house. They would put a sign outside the door with a big red uh, S on it, scarlet fever. And he used to bring food and hand it to my mother through the window. Anyway, that was three months, terrible. Uh, so I lost schooling there. But I went to the Payne Junior High from the to Brockton High. And as I said, I discovered the why for two reasons. One, the swimming pool. I learned how to swim. Not well, because I, gra I thought I was drowning, so I grabbed into some kid next to me, almost drowned the two of us. But we finally got to the side, and that was that. Then I discovered they had a track on, this, I think, a second floor. And it, had a, it was a bank track. And I started running on that. I learned how to run on it. Well, a few years later, when I went to Brockton High, they had a bank track in the old unknown school. Oh, wow. And so I ran on that, and uh, that's where uh, Brockton High and the, my teammates, we became a powerhouse in track and field for almost three years while I was there. Uh, captain the second, second and third year. Uh, we were good enough in the relay team to go to New York, Madison, the old Madison Square Garden. Oh, nice. The smoke was blue. It was... <laughs> I loved it. Anyway, they had a bank track, and the four of us ran against high school kids from New York. And we won and set a record on the old Madison Square wooden track that lasted for 25 years before somebody beat it. The, uh, my teammates lead off Dick, Bills, Dick Beals, rather. Second, Gene Franciosi, who used to be principal of West Junior High. Myself, I was the third leg, and Peter Sakanis was the anchor. And we were taught never to look around to get the baton. You just stuck your hand, stuck your hand out behind you, and it slapped in your hand, you'd be running full speed. That's how we set the record. Uh, Brocken High was a good experience, the only one in my college uh, course. Uh, we graduated 900 kids, and there were three blacks, class of 1949. We have our, I think, a 75th reunion coming up. Anyway, uh, great track team we had. And then uh, we had a track meet at Brown University. Uh, we went down. We were in, entered in the New England, New England track and field. And uh, there was a coach there from Tufts, Digger Dussault. I had never met him. Didn't know who he was. He came up to me and he said, Bob, he said, uh, where are you going to college? And being 18, I said, I don't know. I don't have any money. I said, if I applied to you, Penn, because my brother lives in Philadelphia, I said, in BU, I said, but I don't have, he said, apply to Tufts. I did. I got a job in, on the Cape. I got accepted, went to Tufts, took the pre-med course, and it almost killed me. I flunked my first two courses. I went on probation. I found out later the teacher was a physics teacher, first year. Didn't understand a word that lady said. My other teacher was a, a Nobel Prize winner from Germany or Austria with a thick accent. I don't know what the hell he was talking about either. So I flunked both courses. I said, this isn't for me. I changed and I took a lot of romance courses, French and Spanish, excelled in those two. And I kept taking biochemistry, organic chemistry and you name it. And uh, by my fourth year, uh, I was the only black in my class that graduated. 
And one of my te teammates just sent me a picture of uh, classmates of mine. I didn't know it, but somebody had taken a picture of me with my cap and gown walking across the stage. Two things at Tufts. I was very active in many act activities. I became vice president of my class. I was a class poet. Uh, they had a very famous poet on campus called John Holmes, okay. and I studied under him. And so they had a competition. I won it, and I wrote the class poem and read it at graduation. My mother, my father, and my sister and brother came to the graduation. Now, they came out of Brockton. Everybody was white. I was the only black. My father was looking around. I could tell he wasn't sure if he should be there. But then he found out that his son was very well known by everybody, and so he kind of uh, relaxed. And uh, he, I think he, he was very proud. I know my mother was, because she sent me a, wrote a note later on how proud she was, the fact that I graduated. And then after that, I couldn't get a job, Jensen. Uh, at that time, I had a job washing windows. It's now a hotel, and I did that for seven years. I would get dressed. I'd go to uh, New England Telephone, go to Edison. Edison. They'd say, oh, well, you have a nice resume. We'll, we'll call you. And he used to say, I'm still waiting for the call. <laughs> anyway, uh, I was able to survive, and uh, I ended up moving from Boston to Brockton, lived at home with my folks, went to Bridgewater, great, great school. I did, for anybody, I'd tell them, I got the best education there, better than the one I had in Tufts for my career, which was teaching. I said, I got the foundation and a lot of other things at Tufts. You put those two together, and I call myself hell on wheels. I could handle anybody and anything. Um, and uh, so I enjoyed it, but I got to tell you, Bridgewater, right? But I, I think I may have to say a little bit something to the teachers who come out of Bridgewater, and let's say they go to Brockton High or, or uh, Arnone or the Ashfield, where they have a high number of kids of color. None of these teachers, many of them don't live in Brockton. They live in East Bridgewater, Lakeville, Plymouth. How many, how many of them do you think know a black kid and had lunch or was invited to their home for dinner? I don't think so. And so I'm wondering if the schools of education are teaching these teachers how to t deal with kids who are very much different from them. I hope they are. I don't know. Cause, uh, I taught it, by the way, I taught at Harvard for seven years, and I was teaching management courses, budgeting, etc., for principals who wanted to become superintendents. Great experience. Harvard treated me very well, and I knew that um, they, let me put it this way, you got ev evaluated by your students. A lot of them were international. They were educators in Dubai, in Pakistan, China, you name it. And so they were tough. And I used to get high marks. I was very proud of that. I heard from the dean, and he would always say, you're doing a good job. I enjoyed that. So for seven years, I taught. When I walked into North Junior High, the, the principal wanted me. I don't think the other three did, because I was black. He didn't care. He wanted a teacher. He looked at my resume. So I walked in the first day. I walked in, so this was in, uh, just before school opened. And the vice principal saw me, and he said, not hello. He said, I hope you have a thick skin. And what the hell does he mean? I, I swear. What does he mean by that? Well, I found out soon he gave, he was the one that gave me, that did the schedule, we called it. I had the kids that were the slowest kids in the school. I was teaching history, English, social studies. I had five different subjects. And uh, I enjoyed it thoroughly. Those kids didn't know what to make of me because I was well-dressed, well-spoken, and I took no crap from anybody. And they kind of challenged me. Now, they had several bad boys. Some of them are in Walpole right now in prison for murder. And yet, they, I loved those kids because they came from tough backgrounds out of Boston. And uh, in order to teach them, I used to have them at the class. There were 12 of them. And we'd talk about their experiences and what problems they had. And they would open up to me because I guess they thought I was listening. And then I used to teach a class backstage of the Beatles. Now, they're not my favorite uh, music group, but they had come on the scene and the kids were excited about them. And that's when the hair started growing long 
And that's when the girls' skirts got shorter and shorter. And we had a rule at North Junior High, if your hair is, touches your shoulders, you better cut it off. The boys used to let their hair grow. And one of them, I'll never forget, I won't give his name. His mother and father came in because he disrespected them. He wasn't going to cut his hair. I said, Jimmy, he said, I'm not going to F him, cut my hair. I said, you know what the rule is? He said, yes. I said, well, you got to follow the rules. I don't, he swore and blah, blah, blah. I said, when you come back to school tomorrow, I said, I want to see that hair a little shorter. I'm not cutting. He went home. And the next day he came in, he hadn't cut his hair. I said, okay. I said, there's a barber down the street. Here's a couple of bucks or something. Go cut your hair. And he came back and it was cut the way it should have been. I said, you see how easy that was? And I loved the kids, but they were tough. Oh, they gave me a run for their money. But my experience coming from uh, Roxbury and Brockton, I was one of them. Only I was older and I was a teacher. And they tried to challenge me. At North Junior High, I had a, my own little track team. And uh, they challenged me one day. Hey, Mr. Jones, he said, You're, you were a high jumper. I said, yeah. He said, we want to see you high jump. I said, look, I'm 40 years old. I haven't high jumped since I was 22. We don't care. We don't believe. Well, I got out there. I had my shoes. And I was at a suit. We don't believe you can. Well, I tried it. I almost killed myself because what I high jumped. Today, they have uh, mats that are four feet thick. In my day, sand that was only two inches. Well, I ended up doing six feet in my clothes. I shocked myself. And they used to challenge me in the, in the corridors in the 50-yard dash. And there was one kid that used to, I could not beat him for the life of me. I still, I mean, it was muscle memory. And he, his father was a firefighter on the school department. And he ended up going to, I think, a, uh, Arkansas. And he became an outstanding runner. So there were three of them that became pretty, pretty good. That was a fun, ex all at North Junior High. That was a fun, fun thing. My mentor was Jerry Long. <clears throat> the old uh, Perk, um, Junior High School now, that's on uh, Crescent Street. Okay. Now, it's, it was a junior high in my day. It's now the Adult Learning Center, Payne Junior High. And in that school, they had a big auditorium. It's still there. Mm -hmm. And we used to play basketball in that auditorium. There was wooden seats that folded up and we push them on the side. Right. And I, uh, Jerry was my basketball coach. Well, I could jump. I couldn't shoot. I never did learn how to dribble correctly. Right. Uh, but he had me on the team. So if anybody passed the ball, I could get down under the basket and I would stop and wait for somebody to come along because I was a poor shooter. Anyway, he became assistant superintendent, and there was another man called Al Jongren, and he had graduated from Tufts, and he heard of me. And when, it, when Brockton High School it took him eight years before they decided not to have two separate high schools, but just one. Right. And the high school where it is now used to be a lake or a dump, and you'll notice there's a pond there now. Well, the architects that they selected and the construction people out of New York, that's where they decided the high school. And there was a dispute. I think Wynn Farwell is trying to find out the fine arts building was supposed to be and where the phys ed building is now. Somehow that didn't work out. So the phys ed building is on one end, fine arts building is on the other. I think it was supposed to be reversed. Anyway, Jerry said, Mr. Long said to me, he said, Bob, oh, he had to advertise for the job to assist him. And he picked me. Well, there was one guy that he didn't pick who got angry because he selected me. And he would, he'd, even, even when he was in his 80s, he would tell me to my face I should have got that job. But Jerry selected me, and then that's when uh, they decided the high, where the high school, one high school, only one library, et cetera, et cetera. Right. The uh, superintendent at the time was Anthony D'Antuano, very guy, very good guy who was full of energy and vision. You have to have vision. And he had the vision to have that whole school integrated in one instead of separate buildings. The architect that they got, I worked with them in this wonderful group. They had their faults like everybody. Uh, but Jerry, one day, he said, Bob, he said, the budget is going to be $16.9 million. Think of this now, mm -hmm. $16.9 million. And we're going to give you $2.8 to buy to equip the whole building. 
what was I supposed to do? 2.8 million. Right. And being from Tufts, being a Virgo, I got hold of that and I ran with it. I was writing bids. I got good people. You're only as good as the people you have around you. And I always selected the best, the brightest, the quickest. And that's why I was able to advance. I wouldn't have been able to do it with the people that I had around me. But we were writing bids. The equipment was coming in. Where the hell do we put it? The high school was being built. So the old unowned school had been emptied out. So I put the furniture and equipment in that building. And one of the, uh, I hired a couple of local guys as guards to watch it at night so the kids wouldn't break in. And when it came time to bring that equipment to the high school, just like clockwork, one of my assistants, he and I carried those desks from W.B. Mason and put them in place. I went around and put posters, desk is going to be here, telephone is going to be there, had it all my mopped out, mapped out, I'm sorry. It went like clockwork. The teachers came in. They knew exactly where they were going to go. Everything was set up. The telephones worked. It was beautiful for me at any rate. And then after that, Jerry said, well, Bob, he said, we need somebody to, to uh, watch, maintain the buildings, the school buildings. They were built in the 1950s. They needed roofs. They needed this, that, and the other thing. I ended up writing bids for them, ordering stuff. And then I started going out looking for teachers. And then I started doing the budget. And at that time, it was 10 million and 20, 30. And the last budget I did as superintendent, as I recall, was 98 million. Now it's going to be up, what, two or 300 million for the budget? I don't know. But it was a progression. My advice, uh, study hard. Lots of reading. Reading prepares you for the future. And when I say reading philosophy, history, uh, in my life, I've discovered that a lot of students and kids don't know about their history. They don't know whether, where their parents came from, how they got here, whether they came from Ireland or Italy. And I think that's a shame because if you don't know where you came from, how do you know where you're going? And don't, le don't let anybody tell you what you can't do. There's no such word in my vocabulary as can't, only can. And if there's an obstacle, I've got to find a way to get around it, over it, through it, somehow. I'm going to uh, get my objective. So every day, even though I just turned 90 in August, I have a list that I make every day of what my goals are for the day to see if I can accomplish them. And it works very well for me. It keeps me very well organized.